Thank you everyone for tuning into YouTube today. I'm a little behind having gotten the chapters out that are read that I wanted to, but we are today on book three of the Dresden Files called Grave Peril. We are on chapter, looks like 14, so if you've missed the previous chapters, do let me know down below. Also, if you've missed the other chapters or missed the other books, please do go take a look at the playlists. And as always, please do comment if you want books in the future after the series is done read. <clears throat> so without further ado, here's chapter 14. No, I said into the phone. I tossed my coat onto a chair and then sprawled out on my couch. My apartment laid covered in shadows, sunlight filtering in through the sunken windows high up on the walls. I haven't gotten the chance yet. I lost a couple of hours detouring to pull a spell off for Mickey Malone. From SI, someone had wrapped barbed wire around his spirit. Mother of God, Michael said. Is he all right? We'll be fine, but it's four hours of daylight lost. I filled him in on the Mort Lindquist and his diaries, as well as the events of Detective Malone's house. There isn't much more time to find Lydia, Harry, Michael agreed. Sundown's another six hours. I'm working on it, and after I got Bob out the door looking, I'll see if I can hit the streets myself. I got the beetle back. He sounded surprised. It's not impounded? Uh, Murphy fixed it for me. Harry, he said disappointed. She broke the law to get your car back? Darn tootin' she did, I said. She owed me a favor. Hey man, the Almighty doesn't arrange for me to be anywhere on time, and I need wheels. Michael sighed. There isn't time to debate this right now. I'll call you if I find her, but it doesn't look good. I just can't figure it out. What would this thing have to do with that girl? We need to find her and work on the connection. Could Lydia be responsible for the recent disturbances? I don't think so. That spell I ran in today, I, I've never seen anything like it. It was... I shivered, remembering. It was wrong, Michael. Cold. It was... Evil? He suggested. Maybe, yeah. There is such a thing as evil, Harry, in spite of what many people say. Just remember that there's good, too. I cleared my throat uncomfortable. Murphy put out the word to the folks in blue. So if one of her friends on patrol sees a girl matching Lydia's description, we'll hear about it. Outstanding, said Michael. You see, Harry, this detour of yours to help Detective Malone is going to help us a great deal. Isn't it that a very positive coincidence? Yeah, Michael. Divine fortune, yada yada. Call me. Don't yada yada the Lord, Harry. It's disrespectful. God go with you too. And he hung up. I put my coat away got out the nice heavy flannel robe and slipped into it, then went over to the rug against the south wall, dragged it away from the floor, and hinged and the hinged door there, and then swung the door open. I fetched a kerosene lamp, lit it up, and dialed the wick up to a bright flame. I then got ready to descend the folding ladder into the sub basement. The telephone rang again. I debated ignoring it. It rang again, insistent. I sighed, closed the door, put the rag back in place, and got to the phone on about the fifth ring. What? I said uncharitably. I have to hand it to you, Dresden, Susan said. You certainly know how to charm a girl the morning after. I let out a long breath. Sorry, Susan. I've been working. It's not go going so well. Lots of questions and no answers. Ouch, 
she said back. Someone said something to her in the background, and she murmured a response. I don't want to add to your day, but do you remember the name of that guy you and Special Investigations took down a couple months ago? You know, the ritual killer? Oh, right. Him. I closed my eyes and grumbled about my memory. Leo something. Um, Kavat, Kamner, Corner, Craven the Hunter. I didn't really get his name. I tracked him down by the demon he was calling up and nailed him that way. Michael and I didn't hang around for paperwork afterwards. Krovos? Susan asked. Leonard Krovos? Yeah, that might have been it, I think. Great, she said. Super. Thank you, Harry. Her voice sounded a little tense, excited. Uh, do you mind telling me what's going on? I asked her. It's an angle I'm working on, she said. Look, I've got right now are rumors. I'll tell you more as soon as I've got something concrete. Fair enough. I'm sort of focused on something else right now anyway. Anything you need help with? God, I hope not, I said. I shifted the phone a little closer to my ear. Did you sleep all night? Last night? Maybe, she teased. It's hard to get really relaxed when I'm unsatisfied. But your apartment's so cold, it's kind of like going into hibernation anyway. Yeah, well, next time I'll make sure it's a hell of a lot colder. I'm shivering already, she purred. Call you tonight, if I can. Might not be here, she sighed. I understand. Potluck then? Thanks again, Harry. Any time. We said goodbye and hung up, and I went back to the stairs leading down into the sub-basement. I uncovered the trap door, opened it, got my lantern, and clumped on down the steep, folding staircase. My lab never got any less cluttered, no matter how much more organized I imposed on it. The contents only grew denser. Counters and shelves rang along three walls. A long table ran down the center of the room and with enough space for me to slip sideways down its length on either side. Next to the ladder, a kerosene heater blunted the worst of the subterranean chill. On the far side of the table, the brass ring had been set up into the floor, a summoning circle. I had had to learn a hard way to keep it clear of other debris of the lab. Debris. Technically, everything in the lab was useful and served some kind of purpose. The ancient books with their fading, moldering leather covers and all their all parasive, musty smell, the plastic containers that, with resealable lids, the bottles, the jars, the boxes, they all had something in them. I either needed or had needed at one time notebooks and dozens of pens and pencils, paper clips and staples, reams of paper covered in my restless, scrawling handwriting, and dried corpses of small animals, a human skull surrounded by paperback novels, candles, an ancient battle axe. They all had some significance. I just couldn't remember what it was for most of them. I took the cover off the lamp and used it to, to light up the dozen candles around the room. And then the kerosene heater. Bob, I said. Hey, Bob, wake up. Come on, we've got work to do. Golden light and the smell of candle flames and hot wax filled the room. I mean it, man. There's not much time on this one. Up on its shelf, the skull quivered. Two points of orangish flames flickered up in the empty eye sockets. The white jaws parted in a pantomime yawn, an appropriate sound coming out of it. Stars and stones, Harry, the skull muttered. You're inhuman. It isn't even sundown yet. Stop whining, Bob. I'm not in the mood. Mood? I'm exhausted. I don't think I can help you anymore. Unacceptable, I said. 
Even spirits get tired, Harry. I need rest. Time enough for rest when I'm dead. All right, then, Bob said. You want work? We make a deal. I want to ride along the next time Susan comes over. I snorted at him. Hell's bells, Bob. Don't you ever think about anything besides sex? No, I'm not letting you into my head while I'm with Susan. The skull spat out an oath. There should be a union. We could renegotiate my contract. I snorted. Anytime you want to head back to the homeland, Bob, feel free. No, 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 the skull muttered. That's, that's all right. I mean, there's still that misunderstanding with the Winter Queen, but... All right, I said. You probably don't need my protection anymore. I'm sure she'd be willing to sit down and work things out, rather than putting you into torment for the next few... Hundred? All right, I said. Bob's eyelights flamed. You can be such an asshole, Dresden. I swear. Yep, I agreed. You awake now? The skull tilted to one side in a thoughtful gesture. You know, it said, I am. The eye sockets focused on me again. Anger really gets the old juices flowing. That was pretty sneaky. I got out a relatively fresh notepad and a pencil. It took me a moment to clear off a space on the central table. I've run into some new stuff. Maybe you can help me out. And we've got a missing person I need to look for. Okay, hit me. I took a seat on the worn wooden stool and drew my warm robe a little closer around me. Trust me, wizards don't wear robes for the dramatic effect. They just can't get warm enough in their labs. I know some guys in Europe who still operated out of stone towers. I shudder to think. Right, I said. Just give me whatever you can. And I outlined the events, starting with Agatha Hagglethorn. Through Lydia and her disappearance through my conversation and Mort Linguist and his mention of the nightmare, to the attack on poor Mickey Malone. Bob whistled. No mean trick for a guy with no lips. Let me get this straight. This this creature, this thing, has been torturing powerful spirits for a couple of weeks with this barbed wire spell. It tore up a bunch of stuff on consecrated ground, and then it blew through somebody's threshold tore his spirit apart and slapped a torture spell on him? You got it, I said. So what kind of ghost are we dealing with? And who could have called it up? And what is the girl's connection? Harry, Bob said, his tone serious. Leave this one alone. I blinked at him. What? Maybe we could go on vacation. Uh, Fort Lauderdale? They're having this international swimsuit competition there, and we could... I sighed. Bob, I don't have time. I know a guy who's possessed a travel agent for a few days, and he could get us tickets cut rate. What do you say? I peered at the skull. If I didn't know any better, I would think that Bob sounded nervous. Was that possible? Bob wasn't a human being. He was a spirit, a being of the never-never. The skull was his habitat, his home away from home. I let him stay in it, protected him, and bought him trashy romance novels on occasion in exchange for his help. His prodigious memory and his affinity for the laws of magic, Bob was a records uh, computer, a personal assistant, all rolled into one. Provided you could keep his mind on the issue at hand, He knew thousands of beings in the never-never, hundreds of spells, recipes, scores of formula for potions and enchantments and magical constructions. No spirit could have that kind of knowledge without it translating into considerable power. So why was he acting so scared? Bob? 
I don't know why you're so upset, but we need to stop wasting time. Sundown's coming in a few hours, and this thing is going to be able to cross from the never-never to hurt someone else. I need to know what it is, and where it might be going, and how to kick its ass. You humans, Bob said. You're never satisfied. You always want to put out what's behind the next hill. Open the next box. Harry, you've got to learn when it's too much. I stared up at him for a moment, then shook my head. We'll start with the basics and work our way through step by step. I stared at him for a moment, then shook my head. We'll start with the basics. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Damn it, Harry. Ghosts, I said. Ghosts are beginning, are beings that live in the spirit world. They're impressions left by a personality at the moment of death. They aren't like people or sentient spirits like you. They don't change. They don't grow. They're just there experiencing whatever it is they were feeling when they died. Like poor Agatha Hagglethorne, she was loopy. The skull turns its eye sockets away from me and said nothing. So they're spirit beings, usually. They aren't visible, but they can make a body out of ectoplasm and manifest it in the real world when they want to, if they're strong enough. And sometimes they can just barely have any physical existence at all. Just kind of exist as a cold spot, or a breath of wind, or maybe a sound. Right? Give it up, Harry, Bob said. I'm not talking. They can do all kinds of things. Uh, they can throw things around and stack furniture. And there have been documented incidents of ghosts blotting out the sun for a while, causing minor earthquakes, all sorts of stuff. But it isn't ever random. There's always some purpose to it, something related to their deaths. Bob quivered, about to add something, but clacked his bony teeth shut again. I grinned at him. It was a puzzle. No spirit of intellect could resist a puzzle. So, if someone leaves a strong enough imprint when they go... You got yourself a strong ghost. I mean, badass. Maybe like this nightmare? Maybe, Bob admitted grudgingly, then spun his skull to face wholly away from me. I'm still not talking to you, Harry. I drummed my pencil on the blank piece of paper. Okay. We know that this thing is stirring up boundary between here and the never-never. It's making it easier for spirits to come across. And that's why things have been so busy lately. Not necessarily, Bob chirped up. Maybe you're looking at it from the wrong angle. Eh? I asked. He spun to face me again, eyes glowing, voice enthusiastic. Someone else has been stirring these spirits, Harry. Maybe they're started torturing them in order to make them jump around in the pool and start causing waves. Now, there was a thought. You mean prodding the big spirits into moving so that they create the turbulence? Exactly, Bob said, nodding. Then he caught himself, mouth still opened. He turned the skull toward the wall and started banging the bony forehead against it. I am such an idiot. Stirring up the never-never, I said thoughtfully. But who would do that? And why? You got me. Big mystery. We'll never know. Hey, time for a beer. Stirring up the never-never makes it easier for something to cross over, I said. So whoever laid out those torture spells must have wanted to pave the way for something. I thought of dead animals and smashed cars. Something big. I thought of Mickey Malone quivering and mad. And it's getting stronger. Bob looked at me again and then sighed. All right, he said. Gods, do you ever give up, Harry? Never. Then I might as well help you. You don't know what you're dealing with here. 
and if you walk into this with your eyes closed, you're going to be dead before the sun rises. <clears throat> Thank you very much for listening to chapter 14 of Grave Peril. Please do like, subscribe, and please do also continue to share this with your friends. Uh, stay tuned for the next chapters. Thank you very much.